Well, good morning. If you're new, I'm Jamie. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is my honor and privilege to invite you to the book of Colossians. According to the sign behind me, we are in the book of Colossians, working our way through this beautiful little letter the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Colossae in the first century. We have made our way to chapter 3, and this morning, uh, our plan is to spend our time in verses 12, 13, and 14. Although for our reading, what I'd like to do is read from verse 1 all the way down to verse 14. So Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, there's one under the chair in front of you, and you will find Colossians chapter 3 on page 984 of the church Bible. And as always, if, if you don't own a Bible, just please go ahead and take that one home with you. That is this congregation's gift to you. Colossians chapter 3. I'll read the passage, ask for the Lord's help on our time together, and then uh, we'll dig right in, camping out in verses 12 to 14. And all should be around 45 minutes or so. This is the word of the Lord. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let's pray. Lord, would you give us understanding according to your word this morning? Would you write your truth on our hearts that we would not sin against you? Would you grant to us your Holy Spirit, to enlighten your word in order that we might see the preciousness of Jesus and to be transformed in His image and likeness in order that God would be pleased with His people. Amen. It was a disaster. They couldn't imagine it going any worse. Mark had only spent two months in Colossae, but that was enough for him and his cousin Barnabas to know the Colossian church had not listened to the apostles' letter. The member meeting went long into the night, and they couldn't agree on anything. There was a lot of talking and very little listening. The deacons were yelling. The elders were bickering. 
Half of the congregation was mad at the other half of the congregation because they wouldn't attend their moon festivals, eat their food. And they wanted to vote them out of the church. That half of the congregation was calling the other half of the congregation compromisers because of their moon festivals and their food, and they wanted to vote them out of the church. One dude keeps going on and on about great visions that he's had. Another dude is starving himself for Jesus. Pastor Epaphras has been missing for hours, not since he had last been seen in the nursery crying like a baby. Has anyone ever been to a members meeting like this? Well, I hope not. And I don't know if this is what Mark and Barnabas would have found had they come to the Colossian church after Paul had written them this letter. I like to think that the Colossian church is a lot like our church. Humble, selfless, obedient to scriptures, always deferring to one another in everything. But not everyone can be cornerstone, right? In truth, I don't know how the Colossians received Paul's letter. Perhaps it was easy for them to correct the false teaching. Perhaps it was easy for them to put off selfish ways, self-glory. Perhaps it was easy for them to put on the new self, to increase in the knowledge of God in in Christ-likeness. Perhaps it was, but I doubt it. I suspect these corrections took time. As they followed the apostles' instructions, as they set their mind on things above, my guess is the changes they needed to enact in their church happened slowly. Which would make sense because of what Paul writes next. Be patient with one another, bear with one another, forgive one another. Well, I imagine it took time in Colossae, because I know it takes time in Piqua. Here's the main idea this morning. You can see this on the back side of your worship guide. As God's chosen ones, live and love like Jesus. As God's chosen ones, live and love like Jesus. To help us Through this passage, we'll divide it into three different parts. First, we'll look at what it means that God chose us. We'll see that in the first part of verse 12. And then we'll look at what it means to live like Jesus from the second half of 12 through 13. And then finally, in verse 14, we'll see what it means to love like Jesus. So that's how it's teed up this morning. Let's dig in. God chose you. Verse 12. Let's take a look at it again. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Paul explains that the Colossian church, the Colossian believers have been chosen by God. They've been dedicated to God, and they've been loved by God. Before diving into what God expects of the Colossian church, Paul again reminds them of who God is and what God has done for them. It's very important before the Colossians are to do any of the change, that they know who they are. Or more specifically, that they know whose they are. They are God's chosen. He chose them. The doctrine of election is a beautiful doctrine. It's that God chose you. Now, growing up, I didn't get chosen for many things. I didn't get elected class president in high school. I couldn't even get elected to my sixth grade advisory council. It was a tight race, but Jenny Limbert, she was the better man. I'd have probably have lost that race if I were homeschooled. Maybe in grade school... You weren't like me. Maybe you were the popular kid. Maybe you were the picker at recess. You were the one who was good at sports. You were assertive. You were the one who got to pick people to be on your team for kickball. Maybe that was you. And if so, bully you. But maybe you were the kid who didn't get picked at recess. 
Maybe the only time that you got picked to be on someone's team was at gym because participation was mandatory. You probably spent your recesses standing around like I did, talking about who knows what, Pokemon or Elf lore or something. Well, the Bible teaches that you were picked. You were chosen. God chose you. If you are a Christian, it is only because of this. God chose you. God the Father set His electing love on you and sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. It was a choice He made before you were born. It was a choice He made before your parents were born. Actually, it was a choice He made before Jesus died on the cross. It was a choice He made before the foundation of the world. The doctrine of election is all over Scripture. Paul tells the Colossians, you were chosen by God, you were dedicated to God, you were loved by God. You can hear similar themes throughout Scripture. Here's just a couple of samplings. Deuteronomy 14.2, of Israel, it is said, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession out of all the peoples that are on the face of the earth. Listen for this again in Ephesians chapter 1. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world so that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. Listen for the same things in 1 Peter, in the opening verses, to those who are elect exiles, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. God's electing love for His people rings out from Scripture, Scripture cover to cover. Some have been worried that the doctrine of election might cause God's people to not care about things like holiness. After all, if God chose me before I was born, I didn't do anything to deserve God's choice of me. His love for me is unconditional, and therefore, well, I can just live in love however I want. But actually, the doctrine of election has the opposite effect. Rather than preventing holiness, the doctrine of election motivates holiness. Paul knows this, and so he grounds the Colossians' obedience in in what he's about to write, in the fact that God has chosen them, given them a purpose, and set his love on them. So the imperative put on in verse 12 is grounded in who they are, in whose they are. Because God has chosen the Colossians, they belong to him. They've been dedicated to his purpose. That's what the word holy means. It means that they were dedicated to some special purpose. Think about it. If God had chosen you before you were born, then He chose you not based on anything in you because He chose you before you were born. And so God's choice of you is not based on anything in you. It's based on everything in Him, namely His purpose. And his love. God elected you, Cornerstone, because he means to use you for his purpose. And this truth is simultaneously one of the most humbling and empowering things you can ever learn. It is deeply humbling because it means that you are far less clever than you thought. And it is deeply empowering because it means that your life has a far greater purpose than you ever dreamed. God has set his love on you. You are God's chosen, holy, and beloved. God loved you. God loved you. Tim Keller helpfully wrote, God loves you not because you are lovely, You are lovely because God loves you. 
You have been loved by God. And God's love of you is not based on your obedience to Him. Your obedience to Him is based on God's love for you. Are you with me? Because that's a really, really important point. Everything commanded of us in the following verses will be impossible until you get this. That God's love of you is not conditioned upon your obedience to Him. Your obedience to Him comes from His love from you. So a wife is not faithful to her husband so that he will love her. A wife is faithful to her husband because he loves her. Those two things, they are worlds apart. One is transactional and the other is relational. And too many Christians, I fear, are living in transactional rather than relational walks with Christ. They believe that if they obey, they will have the favor of God on their life. And that's not true. Because they have the favor of God on their life, that's why they obey. Because he has chosen us and given us his purpose and loved us. This is why we follow his commandments. One draws strength from itself to obey so God will love me. And the other draws strength from God because he loves me. Lock this in your mind. Chosen. Purposed and loved people of God. Lock this in your mind as we move on to the next section. Live like Jesus. Paul goes on, second point. Put on then compassionate hearts, kindness, humility and meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. This is how God's chosen ones, His church, holy and beloved, ought to live. These are the garments that we wear. We put off the old garments. These are the garments we put on. The man and woman gathered into the church of God. This is how we live. Last Lord's Day, we looked at Paul's instructions to put off the old man and put on the new. We, we liken this to taking off old clothes, dirty clothes, soiled clothes, and simply putting on new, clean, fresh clothes that were made by Jesus for us, robes of righteousness, if you will. This is the seamless garment of Jesus' own righteousness that we, followers of Jesus, must choose to put on every day. This is how we live like Jesus. So there's a list, another list. First thing on the list, so Paul says, put on compassionate hearts. Literally, this is translated in the original as bowels of compassion. A very visceral image. Bowels were often associated with the seat of emotions, care and love. It's like your guts. Think of it like guts. Have compassion in your guts. It's probably what we mean when we say it was gut-wrenching. You, you felt it very deep down. It is a display of deep concern over another in their misfortune. It means to be deeply moved by the difficulties of your fellow church member, to feel pity for one another as they're going through some difficult thing, and to feel it deep in your bowels. Well, you might be wondering, wouldn't it just be easier to not do that? Like if... If I just mind my own business and sort of live my own life and deal with my own problems and not really have to think about you and your troubles and your problems, wouldn't that just be so much easier? Yes, it would be. Also cleaner. You wouldn't know my junk. I wouldn't know your junk. You wouldn't have to be a jerk to me. I wouldn't have to be a jerk back to you, and we can just be companions and acquaintances. You can do that. 
Lots of church people do that. But I would just ask you to think about this. What, what would it be like if God took the same perspective with you? You know, well, man, it'd just be easier for me if you sort of just kept all that stuff to yourself. I mean, I'm up here in heaven. I got a good thing going. Angels are really low maintenance. Gabriel can be annoying at times, but for the most part, it's really a good deal I got going here. I don't want you really messing my thing going. But if God ever did that to me, friend, it would be the end of me. I am alive here today because God did not take the easy route. That Jesus felt compassion for me in my need. In the mess that I made for myself. I am alive today. I am alive in Christ today because my God didn't look at my mess and say, well, you made that bed. Now you got to sleep in it. He climbed the hill of Calvary to make it right for me. Those who are chosen by God, those who have been set apart for God, those who have been loved by God, we don't have the right to say, I'll be friendly to you, I just don't want to know what's going on. Just leave your junk at home. No, like our Lord, we feel deeply compassionate hearts toward one another. We offer a hand and we give encouragement and we pick them up when they fall. This is what Jesus did for us. And so this is what we do for one another. That's the first thing on the list. Second thing on the list, put on kindness. Put on kindness. That's a pretty easy one, right? Kindness, to be easy, to be kind, it's rather easy. Kindness is the quality of, of being helpful, That God saw us in our mess and he showed kindness to us. He moved toward us in kindness. In fact, the Bible says that it was the kindness of God that drew us to repentance. And we who have received such kindness from God, ought we not also to show the same kindness to one another? When God saw us in our mess and moved toward us, are we not also to see others in their mess and move toward them? Next, Paul says, Put on humility. Put on humility. C.S. Lewis has one of the better definitions of what humility is. He wrote, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. It's a form of spiritual and relational modesty. It's Philippians 2 verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That's what it means to be humble, to count others more significant than yourselves. You can spot a humble person. They're pretty easy. One of the ways you can spot a humble person, they're great listeners. Have you noticed this? They're great listeners. Instead of waiting for their turn to talk, they just listen. It's rare when you meet someone like this. It's almost like... It's a little like you're not even sure what to do. They're listening so actively and so well. You're not actually used to being listened to like that. It's almost disarming a bit. So instead of having a voice, something to add to the conversation, the humble person encourages those who have a part in the conversation. Now understand that humility humility is not timidity. We're called to be humble. We're not called to be timid. So get that out of your mind. Humble means strong and confident, assured. So when she walks into the room, she doesn't have to be the center of attention. She doesn't have to have a better story than everyone else. Her mind is rarely on what she can add to the group. Her mind is thinking about how she can add others to the group. Because she considers others more significant than she considers herself. Humility is related to the next thing Paul says, put on meekness. This is a fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit working in your life will will produce meekness in your life. 
Meekness means that you're not overly impressed with yourself. They're considerate of others. Meekness means you're willing to waive your own rights to something for the betterment of someone else. Oftentimes in the Bible, this is translated as gentleness. But again, it's not flimsiness. To be gentle doesn't mean to be delicate. The Lord used this word of himself, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, meek. That's the same word. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. In other words, put on Jesus' own meekness and humility, and you will find rest for your souls. How tiring it must be to always be managing your reputation. How tiring it must be to always be concerned about others and their impression of you. Dear Christian, you don't have to do that. Put that off. Put on the new man. Put on meekness. Rest. You don't have to fill every room you walk into. Let others fill the room and build them up. I'm eager for you to know the freedom in that, for the sleep that comes from that. Paul goes on, put on patience. Choose patience. Patience is another fruit of the Spirit. If you are a Christian filled with the Spirit of God, you must be patient. What is the first definition Scripture gives to love? You all know the answer to this. Think back to the very last wedding you went to. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Love is patient. Put on patience. Patience is one of... It is a deeply Christian ideal. Because if it were not for the patience of God, none of us would have survived a single day. Patience just means to endure wrong. It puts up with exasperating conduct. Personally, I prefer the old word. The old Bibles use, instead of using the word patience, they use the word long-suffering. I think that gets closer to what is meant by this word. It's a willingness to suffer long. Is there any more characteristic, more needed in the life of a person who lives in the body of Christ? Put on patience. You might be the sort of person who is exacting in their demands of those around you. You may have given yourself over to some idealized version of your own life, of how it should work of your own church, and so that you have a hard time abiding with any of the messiness that comes with just normal life and certainly church life. And so you might be tempted then to bail at the first sign that things won't go exactly as you think they should or at the pace that you think that they should. And if that's you, friend, I'm so sorry. That's a terribly lonely place to be as you bounce from church to church up until the point when the Holy Spirit shows you just how delusional that is. And if that's you, I would point you to Proverbs 14.14, 14, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come through the strength of an ox. Let me put that into church context. Where there are no people, church is amazing. You always get what you want, and you never have to wait on anyone. But that's not church. That's you standing in a room trying to massage your own back. Church is a body with many members who are built to rely on and depend on one another, who have to, as a result, wait on one another who have to, as a result, be patient with one another, who have to, as a result, to borrow a phrase from Paul, bear with one another. I, I hate to be the one to bear this to you, but um, there is bearing 
involved in being a Christian. This is how I know that this is a real letter written by a real man to a real church because they had to be told, y'all got to put up with one another. For this thing to work, someone's going to annoy you and you got to get over yourself. You don't have to put up with perfect people, just real ones. You don't bear with perfect people. But you do have to bear with people who annoy you. So so, so let me ask. Do you get annoyed at church people? If so, you're in the right place. Just so you know, they're probably annoyed at you too. Do you think Jesus ever has to bear with you? I know he does. Once he told the disciples, Oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? He said that over the disciples. How many times? I think God has probably had to say that of me once or twice or ten times. But I, I thank God that Jesus did bear with the disciples. He bore with them all the way to the cross. And I thank God that God, that Jesus bears with me every day of my life. If Jesus, who reads your mind, who who knows the thoughts and intentions of your heart, if He is long and forbearing with you, how much more should you be long and forbearing with those in your church whose minds you cannot read, whose thoughts and intentions you do not know? Let's keep reading. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving one another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. If anyone has a complaint. Don't you just love that Paul expected that people are going to complain about each other in the church? Complaints are not an anomaly. Paul's a realist. He knows some of y'all are going to complain. For some of y'all complaining, it's like the sixth love language. People are going to complain about what you do and how you are. So, so, So when they do, here's what you do. Just forgive them, fools. Just forgive them. Now, don't take the Apostle Paul here to be making a suggestion of you. Forgiveness has not been suggested to you, dear Christian. It is being commanded of you. Let me put it like this. You are not a good Christian if you forgive. You are not a Christian if you don't. So you're not a good Christian if you Forgive. You're not a Christian if you don't forgive. That that may sound extreme. I took that from Jesus. This is Matthew 6.15. If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Does it sound like the Lord is teaching salvation by works? Like, if I forgive someone, then God will forgive me? Of course, the Lord is not teaching salvation by works. The Lord is teaching how salvation works. Forgiveness is not a precondition for salvation. Forgiveness is a post-condition of salvation. It is the fruit of someone who has been forgiven. As the Lord has forgiven us, we forgive others. And I just want you to, I just want to clear the air. Forgiveness is simply not possible without the Spirit of God. It's too hard. Without the Spirit of God living in you at this moment, you will not obey God's command. So what is forgiveness? There's a, there's, there's a lot of bad ideas about what forgiveness is. Some dear friends and I were talking about this just yesterday morning. Forgiveness is not an end in itself. 
It is a means to an end. Forgiveness is a step toward reconciliation. So reconciliation is the goal. Forgiveness is how you get there. So we don't say, I forgive you, and now I'm done with you. I think sometimes when we say, I forgive you, what we actually mean is, forget you. And we avoid one another, and we keep a distance from, from one another, which means, dear ones, dear ones, this means this, you have not forgiven that person. If, if forgiveness is simply saying the words, I forgive you, and it has no reconciliation involved in it at all, friend, anyone can do that. It's just words. It means nothing. Those of you who have, have been in love in a relationship, you know it's easy to say, I love you. But it's really not the same to walk out love for that person. It's the same thing. It's easy to say, I forgive you. But to walk out forgiveness means you have to pursue reconciliation. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also forgive. So it's, it's almost as if God is saying, all right, I've given you, I'll show you how it works. Now follow my lead. Show, I'll show you what forgiveness is like. Now you just do what I have done for you. Can you imagine what it would be like if God had said to me, I forgive you, Wellman, but I want nothing to do with you. I don't really want a relationship with us anymore, but I forgive you. If God did that, what would that mean for anyone? That's not what God did at all. God forgave you and pursued you, pursued reconciliation. Do you think that when God forgave me and pursued me, that he knew that there was a possibility that I would sin against him again? Well, of course he did. And he did it anyway. Here's what it means to forgive. It is a decision, it is a promise to release that person from the debt, from the obligation that resulted when they injured you. It is a decision, it is a promise to release that person from the debt, from the obligation that resulted when they injured you. That's what forgiveness is. But here's what, we, here's what we tend to do. You wounded me, you hurt me, and so now I've erected a wall between us. To protect myself. That's normal. And forgiveness means I'm going to take every brick off of that wall until you and me, we're good again. It's conscious, active decisions to take steps toward you as if that thing you did never happened. That's what Jesus did for you. And that's what you're being commanded by your God to do for one another. Do you see how much harder that is than just, I forgive you? This is why we need the Spirit of God because I suspect in a room this size that there's some who have been forgiven, but who are refusing to forgive. Still holding a grudge. Still hiding behind the wall. Friend, there's hope. You, you don't have to hide. You don't have to hide behind that wall. You can take it down and you're gonna be okay. Remember whose you are. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's where you are. You don't have to hide. You could take every brick down and you can pursue reconciliation. This is how God's chosen ones, those who have been called to His special purpose, those who are the objects of His particular love 
are able to forgive. What is motivating all of this? What's the power behind all of this? How is it that we will be able to bear with one another and be patient with one another and be meek toward one another and be humble toward one another and be kind to one another and compassionate to one another? How is it even possible? In one way. And that's what we come to last. This is where we'll close. Put on love. Love like Jesus. This is verse 14. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Love is the tool that tunes the instruments to the same pitch. The symphony of God's church will play to the tune of God's love. It's what harmonizes us. It's what keeps us together. It's the power behind all these other little things. Notice in verse 12, it was the beloved who are now putting on love in verse 14. Loved ones giving love. God's love filling their hearts and spilling over their lives to one another. Whoever said that love is free did not understand love. Love is not free. Love perhaps is the most costly of all things. Consider just for a moment what love cost God. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. By this we know love, that He gave His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Love gave Love gives. Greater love has no one than this, than he would lay down his life for his friends. If you're here and you've never known that kind of love, if you've never been a part of a community like shows some of the things that we've been talking about this morning, a community that bears with one another, is patient with one another, is humble and meek, Here is your invitation. Turn from your sin. Trust in Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. And He will cleanse you of your sin and unrighteousness and join you to His people where you will be shown this kind of love, where you will be given this kind of a purpose, where your heavenly Father will love you like this. Trust in Christ today. And then see me after church today. I'd love to hand you some free resources on how to get started in your walk with Christ. Cornerstone, put on love. Love like Jesus. Give yourself to others. Spend yourself loving others in the ways that you've just read. Lay down your life for the benefit of someone else. If you are in Christ, everything that you've ever needed and ever wanted is yours. There is never a time in your life where you will be operating out of a place of emptiness, of true emptiness. You've been filled to overflowing, and that's never going to end the rest of your life. Love like Jesus. Amen. Please stand to your feet.